Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We are working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is CME Group, ticker CME. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. I am using the service quickfs.net to do this. If you are interested in this service, if you like the tool that I'm using here today, go to quickfs.net and sign up. You can use the link in the show notes or tell them that Trey Henniger sent you and I would receive a cut of any subscription that you have have. So this is a great service that I love to use. CME Group operates contract markets for tradings of futures and options and futures contracts worldwide, offers futures and options um, based on interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, agricultural commodities, energy, metals, and fixed income products. So basically option maker, market maker um, offering these contracts tells you a lot about the business. Now the beta 0 0.40 is significant because the beta of that low for an S&P 500 company suggests that it's relatively um, low volatility in the stock tends to suggest relatively high business quality. Let's see if that holds true. Now, return on invested capital. So this is interesting. The first thing you notice is you have 20 straight years of profitability. That's a very, very good sign. You always want to see 20 straight years of profitability. Big check mark for a high business quality. Um, you do see a big decline in 2006, 2007, um, 2008. I wonder if there was acquisitions done here or a lot of investment, but something caused a massive decline in the return on invested capital. Um, it's not a huge deal. It looks like you're pretty stable since then, um, but it's just something to think about. You did reach a low of about 3.8% in 2009, which is just way too low to be acceptable, but we've been trending upward over the last decade, which is really nice to see, and we're now at 8.69%. Still a little low. You want this to be in the double digit number, but you know maybe they're going to pass 10% in the next few years. It could be very promising here. Now, if I had to guess, this number is being calculated, of course, on an intangible basis, probably the tangible assets on this business are much lower and that probably plays into it as well. Now what's interesting is you look at these 10-year median margins are just simply amazing. 82% gross profit, 57% EBIT margins, 45% free cash flow. These are world-class numbers. You really, really like to see that. What I get concerned is, is these 10-year median returns are just simply too low. 2% return on assets, 7.8% on return on equity, 7% for return on invested capital. I'm not interested in a company that can't earn at least 15% on its equity um, or 10% on its invested capital. Now, again, I'm guessing based upon the type of businesses it is in, capital markets, that it's really um, not an asset problem in terms of tangible assets, but probably just some investments that they have made. Um, the PE is quite high, PE of 25 for something that's earning this such low of a return on equity. You can clearly see that something doesn't add up. The business is being assumed that it's high quality here. Um, you can see that laying out um, in the business, and yet you are paying you know 2.6 times book for something where book should earn 7.8%, so something's not adding up here. Now, why are these numbers so poor? Well, you have a 10-year Kager like this. You've grown assets at 17% while only growing your revenue at 3.6%, only growing your EPS at 3%. When you do that, your returns are going to be poor. You don't want to grow your assets that much faster than your earnings per share. So that's what we're seeing here. That's why these numbers are the way they are. Now, if you're enjoying this video so far, please hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. I'm working through every company in SPI 500. And if you want to see those videos, you need to subscribe. You need to ring that bell. Then you can get notified as I upload new videos each and every week going through every company in SPI 500. So Join me for the ride, hit that subscription. Now let's dive into the income statement. So you can seriously see these high gross margins here, very low cost of goods sold relative to revenue. Um, SGNA is a significant part of the cost compared to the cost of goods sold, but still very, very high operating margins. Um, <laughs> Net interest income, they are paying interest on this, which is interesting. Um, so they're leveraging up the balance sheet here, it looks like. You do see a growing number of shares, which doesn't really make sense to me. Um, I'm, again, I'm still guessing that this is going to be a relatively um, capital light business. So I don't know why they can't simply buy back shares instead of issuing so many shares. Um, your, your record would be much better. Now, you do see in 2016, 2017, a big jump in the NPS, 12, 11, 94. But you can clearly see that's not a sustainable number, so we should just ignore it. But anytime you take EPS from 270 to $8, that's actually really good. What's interesting to me is that something doesn't match up here because it said that our EPS growth is 3% over the course of the decade, but $2.70 to $8 is not 3%. That's 
double digits. So some of the numbers I'm seeing here clearly aren't adding up, um, which means, for instance, that these kagers are, are probably not being calculated correctly. So if we look at the balance sheet, this is exactly what I thought. You have your PP&E here, um, has actually gone down over the course of the decade. You've gone from 800 million down to 500 million. So they've pulled capital out of the business, but goodwill and intangibles is very, very high. You have $30 billion of goodwill and intangibles um, compared to your PP&E. So again, that's playing a factor in your returns on capital that to in a big way. Now, other current assets is also huge. You go from having 9 million or sorry, nine billion in other current assets to 158 billion in other current assets. And this is the whole business here. So without being able to understand what this line is, it's gonna be really hard to assess what's going on. Um, so take this with a grain of salt. Um, you're gonna to have to do more research on this because this number is massively distorting your assets, massively distorting your returns. It's really leading to that 17% annualized growth in assets, all because of this back-weighted growth here. Um, so just be aware of that. That's definitely coming into play. Um, you can see their liabilities growing as well. Now it's probably just maybe the number of options that are being bought and sold, um, all the contracts and just simply outstanding contracts could really lead to that perhaps in this business model. Um, because you actually look at long-term debt and it's quite low, 2.6 billion. Um, and so really I think that's, you know, you're, you're offsetting these with other current liabilities. So because so much of this falls under other, it's going to be really hard to make a, a good assessment here. Now you do have dividends being paid every year, but you're, you're not really buying back stock. For whatever reason, you're issuing stock. I don't know why you need a lot of stock-based compensation for a business model like this. Um, just pay your people in cash. But you're paying a lot of dividends. They're not stable, it's going up and down. Um, not stable and growing. So just something where um, it's gonna be hard to predict that, which is, which is a little difficult for you as an investor. You wanna have predictable cash flows, predictable um, dividends paid out. <sighs> I have a feeling this business is really, really good. You don't see 10 year margins like like this. It, there's a lot of suggestions here that this is a high quality business. What I do not like is this revenue growth at 3.6%. That's simply too low for me to be super interested and pay a multiple like, like 25 times. I wanna pay a multiple like 15 or less, almost always. Um, even for high quality companies, I wanna get 15 or less. Um, the exceptions come when you have really high revenue growth, 10, 15, 20%, and you think you can sustain that for another decade. We don't see that here. Um, you're a slow grower, and so because you're a slow grower, just call it 4%, paying something like a PE of 15 is reasonable. So I'd say this company's overvalued. Now, with that said, it appears to be very, very high quality. These numbers here are distorted. Um, when you have that many assets on the pay balance sheet, which might not actually be real assets that have to play against you, then the actual return to equity might be higher than that. So it's it's really hard to tell what's going on there. You can see these numbers drifting up over time, and I think that's probably telling the true story, um, that you're getting high incremental returns as you grow. Um, but still, the growth is really low, and, and that's concerning to me. So for me, I'm not going to include this on my watch list, but anyone interested in capital markets, this could be a really interesting company. Um, the fact that it's focusing on futures and options is a little less stable to me than something that's focusing on equities. So again, that would be something I would avoid. But if you found this interesting, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell so you can get notified as I upload new videos each and every week covering new companies. If you want to see those companies, you need to check out the playlist that I have for every company in the S&P 500 and you need to be subscribed. Now, if you enjoy this content, if you enjoy um, using this type of software, then consider going to quickfs.net, signing up. I have the affiliate link in the show notes, direct link in there. If you sign up using my link, um, free or paid, then I get credit for that. Um, and I, I'd love for you to support me in that way. And best of luck to you. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.